Right, 30 odd years ago, Leslie Feist was born in Amherst, Nova Scotia. Now, we don't know what she sounded like then, but that little girl went on to make a whole lot of noise. But first, she had to find her voice. I asked my mom recently, there must have been a reason why you put me in choir at six so young. And she said, well, because I couldn't make you stop singing. So after Leslie's parents split up, she moved out to Calgary, where she started her career as the lead singer of an all-girl punk band called Placebo. By the way, their first gig, opening for the Ramones. Now, if you're in a punk band, you gotta do an awful lot of screaming, and that can lead to an awful lot of damage, and that's what happened to Leslie. She nearly lost her voice, so she packed up, and she moved to Toronto, and she saw a vocal cord specialist. His verdict was simple, no singing for a year. So what did Leslie do? Did she give up music? Well, no, she got a four-track and a guitar and figured out a new way to make music. She had her first solo record called Monarch. Oh, by the way, she dropped her first name and simply became known as Feist. Now, Monarch got good reviews, but not enough people were listening. Well, that was about to change, because Feist hooked up with a group of musicians called Broken Social Scene. Suddenly, Feist was in demand, so she gave her solo career another shot. She put out an album called Let It Die. The critics liked it again, and people bought it. But nothing could prepare Feist for the reaction to her next record, and in particular, this song. One, two, three, four, tell me that you love me more. The song is called One, Two, Three, Four from Feist's third album called The Reminder. Maybe you know it because it's been on every radio station a million times, or maybe you know it from the iPod commercial. Either way, Feist has had a hell of a year, four Grammy nominations, five Juno Awards, and best of all, she doesn't have to scream anymore. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to Feist. Let me ask you a question. Do you know when your career is taking off? Like, I know you put a lot of work into it. I first interviewed you 10 years ago, and you're, you've been slugging it up for a long time. Do you know when all this is happening around you where people are starting to talk about you? I, I actually just had, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just had a second watching the bio thinking, I, I, I guess it has been quite a year, but yeah, from the inside, it's just, you know, you're just living and tired and hungry and laughing and it's just kind of a, you just adapt, you know, to whatever's right in front of you. So, no, I didn't realize it until you just pointed it out, so thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> what we're here for. I, w I wonder if, uh, I mean, and, and I guess every personality is different, but for you, is it, is it better to see the tree and not the forest? Is it better to not see what's happening around you? I think I maybe even purposely cultivate a bit of naivety about the whole thing, just because... I mean, it's, it's it's incredible, and the only way I actually really live it is at the at gigs. So luckily, I play like nine nights a week, you know, <laughs> and, and so it really, it's like that's real. There's four walls. It's enclosed. There's you know, people brought their bodies there. It's different people every city. It's you know, it's well, unless they travel from city to city, but it's you know, it's then just they're it's, just creepy. It, yeah, <laughs> it's just like it just is sort of this. Uh, you know, indication of something on a big scale, just but small and kind of realizable right in front of you. And, and it's something I really like about the shows too, because they're over when they're over. You know, it's not this kind of archiving, except for the people with YouTube, you know, with their cell phones in the air. But other than that, it's, it's just something that's really nice. It, it happens in a moment and then it's finished. And, and that kind of, it's like, you know, you're only as good as your last whatever, you know, it's sort of an, a way to just keep renewing things for myself every night, as opposed to what lives kind of on beyond me, which is sort of this, you know, hologram over there that's sort of the two-dimensional version of, of me that's out in the world, you know. I heard a supermodel once say that that was the monster, that person that you see that people talk about, that's the monster, that's who it is, <laughs> and then this is just who I am, and that they're very different people. Well, models sometimes are two-dimensional, they're very, uh -huh. very thin. <laughs> <laughs> 1D, they are 1D. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know how much you reminisce, but your first gig was a battle of the bands that you won, and, yeah. you're, and you played on the same stage as the Ramones, which has got to be pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was in 1993, and I was maybe 16 or 15 or something like that, and, and uh, we won the, my high school won, and then the prize to win the high school battle of the bands was the kind of citywide high school battle of bands, and there's an all ages one and over ages one. And so then we won the all ages high school citywide, and the prize was um, 
to get to play at this festival that was happening that summer out, out, out of Calgary, outside of Calgary. And in July, I think, 29th, 1993, which is, I know because I still have the gig poster up on my mom's <laughs> basement wall. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was it. And, and the Ramones, you know, it, it, over time, everything gets kind of, you know, simplified and it wasn't like I was, yo, Joey, yeah, like You're hanging out. For the Ramones, yeah. yeah, I know, it was like they got helicoptered in, you know, and played <laughs> and left and, and, you know, whatever. But it was, it was, yeah, it was, that was where it all started. Now, you look at it this way, you could be like David Hasselhoff and be huge in Germany. Instead, it's much cooler to be huge in France. Yeah. You know, which, I mean, France is a place where it really started to build for you. Yeah, it's just, I mean, me and Gonzalez, who actually is in the CBC building right now, he's doing a... Uh, Gian Gometti show. Thank you, which you can hear every day on CBC That's Radio right. One. That's um, mm right. -hmm. And um, yeah, we, we, he, he's the guy I made my records with, and um, and an old friend from Toronto who moved to Berlin, and then touring there, and I was touring with him, and um, and then we just happened upon France, and all the stuff started to kind of slowly unfurl, and it just seemed so unlikely and so strange, and. And he said, only in Paris could a girl from Calgary be somehow exotic, you know? <laughs> like, ooh, you know, the same way a Parisian here would be like, listen to her accent, it's so cute. Like, they're like, yo, how's it going? It's like somehow interesting to the French. So what a mystery. And also, I was I'm singing in English. So yeah. that, I mean, the French didn't put the French songs on the album because my French is so dismal. And they the, they actually took them off the record for France. So, for real? Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, uh, I, I think they're probably right. I don't know what I'm saying. So if they can understand that I don't make sense, then they would know more than I did. One of, one of the conversations <laughs> that, that I, I love having with musicians and artists is what their relationship is like with their biggest hit. And some artists run from their biggest hit, and some artists really embrace their biggest hit. Your biggest hit, at least for, for a lot of people, they saw you on an Apple commercial, an iPod commercial. Yeah. What's your relationship like? with one, two, three, four? Um, well, I mean, it's, of course, it, you can't look the gift horse in the mouth. I mean, this extraordinary thing happened. It kind of cut a swath through culture. It opened a bunch of people's ears that normally wouldn't have been open or aware, you know, there's so much out there. It was just sort of a way to, it was like a little, you know, lighthouse for mm -hmm. a minute. But, you know, it's, I have been joking, it's a double-edged sword. It's like cutting a hole there, but it's like cutting a hole here. Oh, Did yeah. you have <laughs> <laughs> so That's what it sounds like. Quite literally. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just, it, you just get a little, I mean, you get any, I think anybody, you get a little sick of yourself, you know? And um, it's just a, uh, and it's also like, you know, you showed that bio, and I kind of was like, yeah, wait, I have been doing this for a while. But, you know, in the last few months, it gets easy to forget that I've actually done a lot over the years. I've played in a lot of bands. I've played a lot of different instruments. I've, you know, like, been the flank person, you know, just supporting someone else's dream. I, yeah. you know, I've done a lot of stuff, and this is just a tiny pinpoint of light in what, to me, is really like a constellation, like a connect the dots. There's, you know, even self-mythologizing your own story like you look at the stars and oh that's a horse and that's and then you make up the myth like the ancient people you know mm -hmm. like you have everyone has their own myth about themselves but this is like kind of erased everything and there's just a single pinpoint of light and it's this one song that that I just have to you know I just have to kind of not stop dead in my tracks because if I did then that would be all that was left right but I'm just gonna keep going something very different from being on the verge to have arrived so I wonder when you go to make another record <laughs> You know, it's there. Do you feel an expectation from from others? Do you have a different expectation from yourself? Uh, I I uh, <laughs> I think I'm gonna do what I did with the reminder, which is I kind of played a bit dumb. You know, I again, I, I I mean, like you said when we first started, just sort of cultivating a certain mm -hmm. cluelessness about it, just trying to pay attention to what's right in front of you and not look at the from look at yourself from the outside. You know. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was this, all this kind of benevolence that people's ears had been open to let it die, which was so unlikely. I, I, I mean, Gonzalez and I, it was kind of like, a, until, a, you know, the Junos or something in 05 or whenever that was, it was still kind of an inside joke that people had even heard it. I mean, <laughs> Gonzo and I were just like, kind of, what is going on? This is so weird, you know? And, uh, you know, with gratitude and stuff and, you know, taking the job in front and figuring it out. but. But um, I, I didn't play the songs at all the way they were on Let It Die. You know, the way I had to kind of realize them live. I'm a guitar player and there's no guitar on that record. And, you know, 
I, I didn't have the players I'd, I'd played with my whole life. I was living in a foreign country and trying to find people who'd heard of Fleetwood Mac so I could Why understand, would you, you know? Do that? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, actually, there's so many, the French, like, what they know about is nothing that I know about, and what I know about, they don't know about. I mean, I just thought, if a drummer doesn't has never heard of Fleetwood Mac, maybe I don't want to be playing with them, you know what I mean? Or maybe you do. Oh, yeah, gonna, I don't know. We're, we're going to take a break. We're going to yeah, come okay. back. We're going to talk about, uh, well, a, a great experience you had on another television show, Obama, and if we have time, two minutes, 20 questions. More with Feist when we come back. <laughs>